the producer just sent this to me. Oh my God, it's deportation day. Oh my God. He's kissing children. It's auntie, it's my dad's sister. It breaks my heart. I'm the series director and producer of The Exiles, and it centers around racially motivated deportations of Asian men after the Second World War out of the UK and Australia. During the pandemic, I came across this fascinating story which talked about Chinese seamen in Liverpool who had served in the Second World War for, and then mysteriously disappeared after the war had ended. They'd married local women and had children with them, set up businesses, and over the course of one or two years, literally hundreds were disappearing. But the twist for me was the mention of Singapore as a place where these men were then taken to um, when they were deported from the UK. What happened to these men in Singapore? Where did they go? Did they have families? Are their families aware of this story today? The Liverpool Chinese seamen initially came to the port city many years before the start of the Second World War. Liverpool was a huge bustling port and it needed many men who were working on ships which were going across the world from Liverpool. The Chinese seamen were very in high demand because they were hardworking, but also they were able to be acquired at a lower rate than many of the local men. All these men were acquired to work on vessels for the Atlantic crossings, which were very dangerous crossings that went from the UK to America and back, bringing food and fuel back into the UK. So they were really an essential lifeline. Come the Second World War, borders closed, and these men who were from China were unable to go home. So in effect, they were stuck in Liverpool, and that's why they ended up living there, finding wives, having children, starting families. When the war ended, there was an assumption, obviously, they had seemingly won their right to live and keep their lives going in Liverpool. Another issue was there was some industrial labour action where the Chinese men said they wanted to be paid um, higher wage. They achieved that higher wage, but come the end of the war, many of them were labelled as troublemakers. So that really marked them out as unwanted, undesirable men to be removed from Liverpool as quickly as possible and in a sense replaced by cheaper labour that these shipping companies would be able to bring in afterwards. So the British Home Office had planned to remove these men. That's why they started to disappear. So a big question we had when we were working on this project was who are these men? What were they like? What were their profiles? Certainly many of them came from Shanghai. There's also records they came from Singapore, Hong Kong as well. One of the first things I did was to go up and, and recce Liverpool. That's when I first met Peter Fu, who's one of our characters. Okay, I'm going to educate you now. Please do. Basically, just after the war, the Chinese who helped this country out were forcibly deported. And my father was one of them. What happened with your father, may I ask? Well, he helped this country out, going to America to get all kinds of stuff and bring it back. Oh, he's in merch. Yeah, and then uh, he got deported, but it was kept a secret for, 70, uh, for 50 years. Another person I spoke to was Yvonne Foley. Now, Yvonne's a fascinating character. Her father was a Shanghainese sailor, and her mother was from Liverpool. Yvonne had grown up not knowing about her father as a young girl until her mother had revealed to her that actually she was half Chinese and then later on that her father was a Shanghainese. We were quite poor, but Dad would take us out, go to the park. And it was when I was about 11, and then that's when my mother said to me, you know your dad's not your dad. He's not your genetic father. Your, your real father that helped give birth to you was Chinese. Pardon? She said, well, he was Chinese, but he left. My genetic father came from Shanghai. His name was Nan Young. When my father disappeared, my mother was heartbroken and still remembered him. It was obviously a love relationship. A lot of our mothers went to their death believing they'd been deserted. A gentleman in Singapore contacted Yvonne and said his name was Young, his father's name was Young, and his father was in Liverpool and had a relationship with a local lady. 
may or may not have had a child there um, and studied at Liverpool College, which is very similar to Yvonne's story with her father. My father, st he stayed with the girl, he knew a girl in Liverpool, yeah. a British girl, he was in... They had to get place together with her parents. Please note that these stories are passed yeah. down, which yeah. is like all of us, isn't it? Could Yvonne have a sibling or a relative in Singapore? One of the places I went to was eBay, and I just put in Chinese semen. And then I started to find these Singapore identification cards. Here we have photos, thumbprints, dates of birth. So maybe there'll be a name in one of these cards that might lead us to um, someone who's in one of the maritime logs. As we also started to look for the actual deportation um, vessels. Try and see where Singapore comes up. You can see these logs here. They'll say these Chinese names, and it gives the address where they were in the United Kingdom. But it also tells us they were taken to Singapore. We start to build up logs of these names of people in Singapore. From the records that we found, up to 400 men at least were heading towards Singapore. We think that number might almost be doubled because many men jumped ship when they came to Singapore because after Singapore, the, the deportation ship would be heading towards China, which was going through a lot of conflict and turmoil at the time. There's still a large group of the Liverpool children, as they're known, um, who are looking for information about their fathers. I never actually spoke to my mother about my dad. It was like an, an unwritten thing. We just thought he, he, he left us. It's the first photograph I ever saw of my father, and I was very surprised to see how tall he was. It was taken in 1943 in Liverpool. I know she was heartbroken because my mother did not actually know she was pregnant with my younger brother. She tried to have an abortion. But she was so destitute, we didn't have any money. She wanted to protect us and give us a future as children. She actually married because she felt that was the right thing for her to do, to give us a better life. When we found out, and it was actually very shocking to us that these men were forced out of Britain. And so to have this documentation that proves they weren't abandoned, they were deported, they were taken away, was really important. But also it had been shrouded in secrecy, classified for decades. But these are copies of the declassified documents. These were taken from the National Archives. These letters show the correspondence between the different officials as they talk about the deportation of these men. But what was fascinating is in that period of research, this story of a similar deportations happening the same time, but in Australia, during the post-war Australian era. Malay and Chinese seamen and men were being deported out from um, Australia to Singapore, to Hong Kong, under a policy called the White Australia Policy. Now, the White Australia Policy was established in 1901. Um, it was a set of laws that was designed to initially favor British Anglo-Saxon people and later on European, but white people to increase the population size. Non-white people who were deemed to be undesirable were in essence um, made to feel unwelcome, encouraged not to settle in, in Australia. And in these cases, they were forcibly deported. These deportations were extremely public. We are showing some very rare archive in our documentary. And you can see these deportations were carried out in front of crowds of people. Many of these men um, went to Australia at the advent of the Second World War. Obviously, the Japanese were moving through Southeast Asia towards Singapore. So these men were fleeing from the Japanese advances. When they got to Australia, many of them were then um, part of the war effort. During war, these men were serving, but they also had families. So they, they met local women, had children. Not all the ladies who married these men were whites. When we started looking at the documentation for men who had been deported out from Australia, we came across lists of names. So we found this man called Jacob Abdullah, but Jacob Abdullah was married to a lady called Mersha. And Mersha was uh, Australian, she was Aboriginal First Nation. Jacob was deported out. We have this very evocative footage of Mersha watching as Jacob 
is deported and she's holding onto one of her children and the rest of her children are surrounding her as they're crying as he's taken off. So we started to look high and low. Where was Mercia and Jacob in Singapore? Nothing was coming up. Now, after weeks of hitting brick walls, we eventually came across Mercia's grave via a website called Find a Grave. In the grave, it lists Mercia's name with these children she and Jacob had. And very sadly, we discovered that Mercia, she died very shortly afterwards. It's believed to be from malaria. But we had the list of the children. So we started to look for these names. Um, and again, nothing was coming up. It was very, very frustrating. Then one day I was looking on Facebook and I looked under the name of Mersha's family name, Ahmat, A-H-M-A-T, and almost instantly popped up or this gentleman called Samson Z. And I could see he had posted saying, I'm looking for the family of Mersha Ahmad. So I dropped Samson a line and we almost instantly connected up. And that's when I discovered he and his cousins in Singapore and that's when we realized after he made contact with them on Facebook, he hadn't actually gone to Australia to meet them due to COVID. So we realized there was a unique opportunity for us making a documentary to follow Samson and Rohizad as they went back to Australia to have this very emotional reunion with the family in Australia. Hello, honey friends. Hello. This has been too long. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, come and meet the family. Oh, my boys. We love you so much. Our nephews, Azat and Samson. All of your uncles and aunties are your parents' first cousins. This is such a precious time. And the Australian family are incredibly warm. Equally on their side, they had been looking for their Singapore family, Mercia's family for decades. As a viewer, when we're watching this documentary, we're really getting a sense of you know, history healing itself in some way. At least there is a sense of redemption for people in the present day that they can make a connection back um, and, and try and heal some of those wounds. Tell us about what you think about the white Australia policy. I don't think they should have been forced to leave because they stood side by side with the Australians in the war and they had just as much right to be in Australia as I did. So Christine is a really interesting character, very bubbly and has a real passion for sort of family history. Now, we actually discovered her through a genealogy website. Um, we had the, the, a name of a man who'd been deported and a lady who had, had gone back to Singapore with him. And it was through those names we were able to find Christine, who is the granddaughter of the lady who left with her deported husband. She was called Phyllis. Now, she was a white Australian woman moving to Singapore. She went to go and live in a kampong. Really, she seems to have embraced that life. You know, she learned Malay, became part of the community, and it's a very rich story that really tells us a story about acceptance, integration, and kind of this sort of new Singapore that's emerging. Phyllis had um, previously had three sons, one of whom was Christine's father. Now, due to um, a number of reasons, she put those children into an orphanage in Australia. Maybe she didn't have a choice. She was unable to bring them under law. Um, and I know that's obviously a cause of great pain for the family in Australia. I don't think Phyllis wanted to come back to Australia. She didn't believe in the white Australian policy law, so she'd already made a life over there. She just wanted the past to be the past and get on with the future. I mean, we have grandchildren and great-grandchildren that are going to come up and they're going to say, well, where did we come from? I don't want them feeling like I did. I guess there was probably a little bit of guilt there because of the three children that she did put in the orphanage. I could never have done it. And what we must remember is these are only happening one generation ago, two generations ago. We saw during the COVID, there was obviously spikes of um, racially in, in instigated attacks against people, um, specifically targeting Asians or Chinese people. You know, it's very easy for um, harmonious situations to turn sour. And I think these stories are very, very important reminders of the insidious nature of racism 
and how it can manifest itself in different ways.